And I think probably social media hasn't helped with this is mm-hmm. that you, you are one and you seem want to be one and the same thing. And mm-hmm. I think separating yourself as a person from the performance and not attaching your self worth to the outcome is very important, but also very, very difficult. Welcome back to the Human or Athlete podcast with this week's guest, Laura Dees. She is a skeleton slider, double Olympian and bronze medalist at Pyeongchang. We just had a brilliant conversation on going back to the foundations of what it means to just be a human being, to fall back on human connection and what are you passionate about. When all the things in the athlete world go awry and are difficult, it's so important to fall back on these foundations and simplify your life. I hope you enjoy the episode. Please check out our social media at Human or Athlete. with Laura Dees. Thank you for coming on. Thanks for having me. Uh, straight off the bat, jump in. What would you say is the most important, maybe mental skill or value to have as an athlete? I think the thing that's got me furthest in my career is probably determination or like grit, whatever you want to call it, sort of that. Um, just not wanting to to give up because mm. there's been quite a few times over the years like I've been lucky enough to have quite a long career now and there's definitely been points along the way where I could very easily have just said right you know it's too much I've had enough now um, and actually just refu- just keeping my head down working hard and refusing to stop is um, I think has got me quite a long way over the mm-hmm. years. No, I love it I think there's this real blend in, in sport of that hard work grit versus the talent and versus the almost like the general love for it. And it's a really tricky balance to always find because sometimes you can go down the hard route, uh, the hard work route and lose your love for it. And then also you spend too much time focusing on the love for it and you're missing out on the little gains you can get here and there. Do you always like, do you work on finding that balance? I think that's so true. So like with with the skeleton program, it tends to be very all encompassing. So mm-hmm. it takes over your life. And I think it's very easy to, um, sort of not have anything else going on and and that makes it very intense mm-hmm. and it's great when it's going well but if you're going through a tough time with skeleton and you've not got anything else to sort of either distract you or um kind of entertain yourself with then mm-hmm. then that can definitely make it a lot harder um but i think like that that what you were saying about that um the balance between talent and hard work is um, is really interesting as well because I would probably say I, I think I initially got picked for skeleton through it was through a talent search mm-hmm. so um, I obviously had certain attributes that were important for skeleton but I think beyond that once I was in the program it was definitely the fact that I was willing to just grind and work really mm-hmm. really hard that got me um, to where I am now. When you're in that I guess dark place following a, you know a failure in that moment mm. Where were you at mentally? How did you climb out of that hole? I remember thinking, well, <laughs> I had a very, uh, very nice message from Lizzie, which at the time, it really hit home. So she was out at the games, obviously doing doing very well, and I was at home. And she sent me a message saying, I wish we, I wish we could have been doing this together. I wish you were out here mm-hmm. with me. And that was you know, gets you right in the feels. Mm-hmm. And then, so it made it even more special that in Pyeongchang we were there together because mm-hmm. it was like the end of this long road and we'd, we'd finally managed to get to an Olympics together. Um, but I remember thinking after that, just trying to flip it and turn it into an advantage. I remember thinking everyone else is going to be foot off the gas, taking it easy because it's the year after the games mm-hmm. um, and people aren't going to be training as hard. Mm-hmm. And this is where I can I can turn it to my advantage. So gotcha. I yeah. So I'm going to use this summer. I'm going to train as if this is my Olympic year. Mm-hmm. And I think that was the best shape I was ever in because I just had this steely determination mm-hmm. to just prove a point and get out there and yeah, just really show what I could do. So yeah, that I just had that attitude of just work harder than everyone else, mm-hmm. um, and it'll it'll work out. It is, I guess, in a way, and I talk about it quite a lot on here, using that dark energy. Yeah, it's absolutely. The stuff that has a you know bad reputation and obviously if you lose control of it it leads to doing unhealthy you know having unhealthy coping mechanisms to then control that problem but did you manage to yeah to use that positively you used obviously that year onwards 
did you, could you hold on to it throughout the, the four years of preparation or was it like I think as I so I like that phrase dark energy I haven't heard that before but like mm-hmm. it's so true it's really powerful stuff if you can harness it in the right way mm-hmm. and I think I did that after Sochi because um, mm-hmm. I said I came into the that the, the year following that was the first year I earned my World Cup spot mm-hmm. and started to race on World Cup and actually I won a silver medal in my second ever World Cup race oh. um, yeah because I just I just had this sort of attitude of give it everything you've got nothing to lose just show everyone what you can do um and then i think as as i'd sort of felt like i'd proven myself and okay became an established athlete on world cup won a couple of medals Mm -hmm. then i kind of probably that faded out a little bit because Mm -hmm. then it was just about maintaining the level that i was at i didn't feel like i had something to prove in the same way Mm -hmm. although you know you always you're always wanting to aim high but yeah, it was definitely most intense that summer straight mm-hmm. after Sochi. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think I think it's again if it can be managed, having both that love for what you do, but also that that darkness and being able to have both is what makes you like truly a really or allows you to get the best out of yourself at yeah. any level in a way. And it's just such such an important part to having both. I totally agree, and like that determination that I spoke about right at the start. Mm-hmm. I think that's what fuels that a lot of Mm -hmm. the time it's either something really positive that you're trying to do again reinforce Mm -hmm. um or yeah you're you're avenging something (laughs) literally and it's like channeling that into determination like if those are the power sources yeah you're using it in that way take me to pyeongchang what was like the build-up to that where were you at wait like do you have expectations did you yeah leading into that it was really interesting because obviously this, the landscape at the time was that Lizzie was the defending gold medalist. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd won a few World Cup medals and was sort of seen as the outside chance, mm-hmm. bit of a dark horse maybe, but not really sure. Mm-hmm. Whereas obviously everyone knew who Lizzie was. She had this massive pressure of, of defending her title. Um, and by that point in time, Lizzie and I were pretty close. We'd We'd done seasons together on World Cup as well by that point. Um, and so I was very aware that I was sort of flying under the radar a little bit. And I used that to my advantage sort of mentally, um, taking the pressure off myself a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and I I remember in a lot of the interviews leading up to Pyeongchang, where people would ask me what my expectations were. And I would say, I'm going there to win a medal. Mm-hmm. And you could tell that people were thinking, really? you know that doesn't seem like you know a realistic goal and I think truly I me and maybe my coach my my main ice coach were probably the only people that actually believed I could win a medal Mm -hmm. and so that self-belief um and wanting to wanting to prove that there was more than one athlete in the program that could win a medal Mm -hmm. you know um quite honestly that was that was what really drove me um and it was a really interesting season because we didn't have the most straightforward build up to the games. I remember it was a bit rocky. I had, I think I had some good early results mm-hmm. and then it all sort of, it wasn't terrible, but I think we were sort of maybe getting top 10s, top 12s. Mm-hmm. Um, and we weren't, you know, we certainly weren't winning medals week yep. in, week out. But we kind of had this inner steel that we just knew that when it came to it, we were going to rise to the occasion and everything that we do to peak at an Olympic Games was going to come into play. Do you have any idea of where that inner steel came from? <laughs> the impossible question. It was, I think it, for me, a lot of it was the confidence in what had gone before. Mm-hmm. So I knew that, you know, the the team that was going to be in Pyeongchang with me um, or had been with me along along the journey, a lot of them had already had success before because mm. obviously we'd... We had the gold medal in Sochi, um, Amy's gold in Vancouver. We had a silver before that. We had a mm-hmm. bronze before that. So it was kind of this thing of if you just do everything that you're supposed to, then mm-hmm. why not? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so it was just sort of feeling like I was, so to call it sort of, people use the phrase medal factory. It didn't feel like that because it didn't feel like a certainty. But I just kind of had this feeling that, if I did everything that I was supposed to, that I would put myself in a position where I had a very mm-hmm. good chance of winning a medal. Yeah. Um, and as well, like Lizzie was a great mentor at the time as well, because she had obviously been to a previous game. She'd um, 
so if I you know had any questions or I wasn't sure about anything about the Olympic environment like knowing that she was there and that no question was a stupid question was really helpful as well mm-hmm. um and a lot of the stuff she was saying about how it was you know it might be a it might be the Olympic Games but it's all the same people that you race week in week out on World mm-hmm. Cup things like that it was all very helpful so mm-hmm. I did feel like I was sort of part of a team that really knew what they were doing mm-hmm. um and as I said I, I just had to to a certain extent, I felt like I just had to turn up and not do anything wrong mm-hmm. and it would all be okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and that's essentially what happened. Going into the last run, did you know what was going on? Did you know at the end of the run if you'd done it? Uh, so I was lying fourth going into the... So I was fourth overnight mm-hmm. and then I was still fourth before the last run. Mm-hmm. Um, and I quite enjoyed being fourth overnight because I felt like I've got nothing to lose mm-hmm. um, and everything to gain. Yeah. So it was quite a nice position to be in, sort of chasing. Did you sleep? I did actually sleep Slept. remarkably well, yeah. <laughs> it was. It, it, I think it suited me, the timings, because I'm a bit of a night owl and okay. the races were starting at sort of 8.30pm, I oh, think. Okay. So we weren't done yeah. until midnight. Um, so that I think that suited me. Um, and then, so I think... Yeah, so I was still sat in fourth position going into the last run. And it was just that that thing I was saying about consistency. That was the only thing I was really thinking about was just like, it doesn't need to be perfect. It just needs to be in that ballpark mm-hmm. again. Um, and and I think when, when I'm thinking like that, then I can rely on instinct. Mm-hmm. I think if I consciously try and think my way down the track all the time, I never slide that well like yeah. that. It almost has to be... Um, sort of set it and forget it like it has to be an inbuilt thing Mm -hmm. that you instinctively know where you need to be so I think I just sort of trusted that I that that Mm -hmm. was in there Mm -hmm. and didn't try and tried not to sort of overthink it too much and then it was a waiting game I got over the finish line I knew it was a good run then there were three athletes to go in front of me and that's when the that that was like probably the most intense (laughs) eight minutes of my life because I was I was in the leader's box and you've got um, you're you're watching the screen of the other mm-hmm. athletes come down after you. I've got a stand opposite me, full of my friends and family, and like it's almost all Brits, which mm-hmm. is amazing because a lot of Lizzie's friends are out there as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so I can't remember what order. I think it was was it Lizzie next? There was so there were three athletes to yeah. go, and the finally it was it was um, a German athlete, and she came down in front of me, and I thought, okay fine (laughs) all right there's two athletes left to go and then lizzie came down and stayed in front as well and then i thought oh i'm gonna finish fourth and then i started to think then it then it was like i felt like i was on a real knife edge of Mm. this could be great or this could be awful because no one wants to finish fourth at the olympics um so that two minutes when the final slider came down um who was in lying in first position and I could see that it wasn't a good run. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you kind of know where where someone's dropping off and mm-hmm. making mistakes. And I could see I could see her making mistakes on the way down, but I didn't really want to believe that it was gonna, yeah. gonna work, uh, that she was gonna drop far enough for me to go up into third. Um, and I could see the, the splits, the split times yeah. coming down mm-hmm. the track. And I was like, it's getting really close, it's getting really close. But the, lo- the last split, uh, in Pyeongchang is like a long uphill section mm-hmm. and it's really hard to know what's going to happen um, so I didn't want to believe it and I was just like my whole being was just focused on this like <laughs> number in the corner <laughs> of the screen mm-hmm. um, and whether the rank three or four was going to come up mm-hmm. and I just saw the number four and then it just went berserk because yeah. obviously Lizzie then knew she was the champion again I knew I'd won a medal mm-hmm all the Brits went crazy and it was just the most surreal yeah surreal mm-hmm. moment of my life was it relief was there yeah a was... huge amount of relief thus I think that I think the fact that I was so close to coming forth made it um yeah the relief even more intense and then you've just got the fact that like four years of pressure is finally mm-hmm. off your shoulders um mm-hmm. and you've not let anyone down and everyone's there and seeing you and yeah, it's just the most crazy, intense mix of emotions. Mm-hmm. I also remember being really um, feeling very sorry for Janine, mm-hmm. who dropped behind me because mm-hmm. she'd been in a medal position through the whole race. And mm-hmm. like, obviously, it's not, it's no one's medal until the mm-hmm. race is over. But it felt like 
it was hers to lose Mm -hmm. and she and she lost it and so I was very aware that whilst I was having the best two moments of my life Mm -hmm. Janine was probably having the worst two minutes of her life Mm -hmm. um but it just went absolutely bonkers. <laughs> it's it. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, I can't even imagine that it must be one of, the, everyone says it's one of the craziest feelings you'll ever have. Is there, do you, can you, can you see the difference between like, obviously you probably can feel it, but to realise how much weight was on your shoulders over that time, do you realise like the pressure that you had put on yourself or obviously parts of it coming from your environment? Yeah, definitely. I mean, there was a lot of inherent pressure anyway from mm-hmm. being in this programme and um, like we hadn't not won a medal the mm-hmm. whole time the sport had been in the Olympics. Yeah. So I was carrying that, um, probably not to the extent that Lizzie was, mm-hmm. um, but then also you could say that she'd already won a medal, so she was already Olympic champion yeah. anyway. Um, and so, yeah, the, the pressure was incredible and I think the... I remember it feeling like going down a tunnel and just like feeling like you're in this tiny, tiny tunnel and they're Mm. almost being, there's like a pinprick of light at the end, but you can't Mm. really see it. And then the closer you get to Olympic final day, the light's getting bigger and you can Mm -hmm. see that you can see that the end is in sight, but um, yeah, it's just, you're in a pressure cooker. And I think, Looking back on it now, I think I did a really good job of just going into my own little mm-hmm. world almost. And um, I think the team around me did a fantastic job of keeping the pressures of the outside world away yeah. as well. I think in 2018, I mean, the, one of the differences between Pyeongchang and Beijing is that social media wasn't as much of a part of our mm-hmm. life as it is now. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was almost seen as a bit optional, whereas now it feels like it's just part of life. Yeah. So we we shut out quite a lot of external noise, mm-hmm. which I think was a, a good move because there was a lot of um, stuff in the press about our suits mm. at the time. Um, and I think our performance director took the decision that just to keep us away from it as much mm-hmm. as possible. And I think that really helped. I think compartmentalizing is mm-hmm. very important and I think what's very difficult, or I've ha- at points in time have found very dif- difficult, is separating how I define myself as mm-hmm. a person versus how I define myself as an athlete. Mm-hmm. And I think very often, and I think probably social media hasn't helped with this, is mm-hmm. that you, you are one and you seem want to be one and the same thing. And mm-hmm. I think separating yourself as a person from the performance and not attaching your self worth to the outcome is very important but also very very difficult Mm -hmm. um and i particularly struggled with that this year because Mm -hmm. i think coming off the off the back of success in pyeongchang i unlike in pyeongchang in the build-up i had this perception of how other people saw me as an athlete Mm -hmm. which i felt like i had to live up to Mm -hmm. so you know i was thinking you know I, i wasn't in good form and i was thinking People are going to be wondering what's happened to me. People mm-hmm. are going to think that I can't slide anymore, that I've lost my skill set, um, that I'm not mentally strong enough to deal with it, and and all of these things. And but it, a lot of it was linked to how I was worried how people were perceiving me, mm-hmm. um, which was something that I, like I said, I didn't really have to deal with in the lead up to Pyeongchang mm-hmm. very much because that was I was much more of an underdog then. Um, yeah, so that was that was quite tricky this season and it got progressively worse Mm -hmm. (laughs) up until the Christmas break um, at which point I was able to reset mentally how'd you do that Um, so I actually sought help um, from a hypnotherapist okay um, because it was I'd got to the point where I almost I didn't know how to be um, an athlete anymore It, it was it was like I was turning up at the track to race and I didn't I didn't know how to do it. I was really struggling to just go into like like normally you just go into autopilot your normal mm-hmm. processes. And for some reason I was just really struggling to do that. Um so I I I needed I felt like I needed some sort of intervention to help me get back to sort of almost just like reset draw a line get back mm-hmm. to where I was before and almost to be able to put that the racing in perspective because I think what had happened is that the racing had seeped into my whole life Mm -hmm. and when I turned up at the track I felt like I was putting my whole life on the line instead of just racing Mm -hmm. um 
so I, I feel like I, I felt like I needed to get that back in, in proportion and in mm -hmm. perspective. And it worked really well for me. Mm -hmm. um, so I think even though the second half of the season, the results were still really tough, actually, I was framing it a lot better in my head and a lot mm -hmm. uh, in a healthier way, um, which kind of got me through those few mm -hmm. races in, yeah. uh, into the Olympics. Well, the way I kind of see it is if like you've got, if you've got like where, where the balance is on one side, you need like kind of like a laser going to that and that I guess that balance and where you want to be is that riding off instinct right completely the direct line between you that present moment and the goal of being as quickly as quick as quick as you can and but when that kind of stuff comes in whether it be internal and it be your own fear or your own anxieties your own connection to this is my life this is who I am and then you've got the external ones of the press and then you've got external ones of you know people putting this pressure on you or saying this and that and it's just blocking that or putting filters on it, mm. making it weaker and weaker to connect to that present moment where where you're relaxed, where you can let go and be obviously at your best and at your quickest. And I think that so many of them are self-created and obviously so many of them come with the sport and it's the ability to kind of unlock them and let go of them. And it's one of the, it's just such an interesting thing as to how it is about completely letting go. Mm. But the second you get one block in the way you get worried about that block and then you put that, that necessarily obviously compounds the next one and the next one yeah and it's one of the having i can completely relate in that way is that it just takes over and it makes that connection to that present moment where you get to that point where you don't know what you're doing yeah it's it's so difficult yeah. and it's what gets me is it, it just multiplies and because of the pressure that exists it's just getting heavier and heavier I to totally agree and I think skeleton I'm sure you can say this about lots of other sports as well but I feel like with skeleton there's nowhere to hide it's mm. just you on the sled there's not a, there's not a team of people with you and it it exposes you mm. and I think that's like I felt like there was a real microscope on on everything I was doing and I think that the analogy that you gave about like there being layers of like barriers between mm -hmm. you and like that really pure performance that's so true because when when you're at your best on a skeleton sled you're not thinking about anything you're mm -hmm. completely in the moment you don't have any hang-ups and trying to find that when off the sled you're dealing with so much mm -hmm. is incredibly difficult and I think also the mental energy of trying to bring yourself to a point where you can give a great performance every week is exhausting mm -hmm. I like going through that sort of sort of treadmill of having a tough week of training and then having to try and turn that around and, and find an amazing performance mm -hmm. when things aren't going great mm -hmm. that's really really it takes a huge amount of energy it's the the hardest thing i'm sure you can relate is when you you're forcing it because you want it but you want it too much and by forcing it you're tense on the sled you're yeah absolutely if moment. you try too hard it doesn't work either <laughs> it's, the, it's like the biggest irony <laughs> yeah there is yeah so you've got to you know, to be a really good skeleton athlete, you've got to be so, um, like attention to detail is so important. And yet when you're on the sled, you almost can't care about it too mm -hmm. much because then you're not relaxed, you're not letting it mm -hmm. run. So try, yeah, trying to find that state of mind when you're, you know, wading through issues off the sled is mm -hmm. very hard. Very what hard. was, I guess, without obviously the details, but like the hypnotherapy was there, like, did you kind of get to places where I guess to what comes to my mind is that also that like meditative state. Was there like different things that you brought in in those moments um, that did make that difference? It was kind of um, imagining myself in a place, sort of being able to visualize myself in a good place on mm -hmm. the sled. Mm -hmm. uh, I think just tricking my brain into knowing that it was possible to do again. Okay. Um, and almost just reset that fight or flight um, thing that I'd got into I think every time I got to the track it just felt like a massively uh, like a huge mountain to climb like mm -hmm. like a huge very loaded situation of I've got to nail this or mm -hmm. or my whole world is going to collapse mm -hmm. and it somehow um, was able to help me put those things back in perspective and it mm -hmm. wasn't so much about it to try and make skeleton not the be all and end all mm -hmm. in order to make it better um, and trying, yeah, just getting back to that point where it was just just sliding. It yeah. wasn't everything, um, which yeah, it's a bit of a paradox when you. That's the one thing that you're focusing on being better, but <laughs> yeah, I just almost had to sort of reset myself um, and find that 
sort of balanced center again Mm -hmm. where things were yeah in the right perspective how do you do you see yourself behind the athlete Ooh, that's an interesting question. I'm not used to thinking of myself as anything other than an athlete. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's sometimes why time away from a sport can be really helpful because mm-hmm. it sort of reframes you as a person. You think, mm-hmm. oh, yeah, I'm quite a good friend as well. Or like, mm-hmm. oh, I'm, I'm okay at being a wife and an mm-hmm. uh, auntie and all those things. <laughs> so I think, yeah, that's, that's a part of the thing for me now, I think, post-games is sort of reconnecting with all that. And I think COVID hasn't helped as well because yeah. we've been so isolated from each other. Um, that's made things feel even more intense. But I think definitely that's something that I need to work on is how do I define myself outside of being a skeleton athlete? Because mm-hmm. it's I think it's a dangerous position to put yourself in where you don't have anything else. Um, like, yeah, the fact that I'm finding it difficult to answer that question, <laughs> I think, tells you everything you need yeah. to know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think, like, the, again, another way that we kind of look at it and talk about probably way too often on here is is that if those foundations are built on the sport or what you do which is why it's so interesting to be an athlete because it's intensified into such a short space of time like obviously loads of people are going through a lot of pressure a lot of different things on the line jobs on the line um, and never devaluing that but there's almost time there's you know, there's time that's passed over things. You're being thrown into situations that last a minute mm-hmm. and yeah. with everything on that. So it intensifies it. And that's why it's so athletes in 10, 15 years experience a huge amount that people experience in 60 years over a job and what they do. And so it's very easy to, to get attached to those foundations of this is what I do. But when there's one storm comes and another storm comes and like, I guess, in a monsoon where it doesn't seem like you can come out of it, and you've got nothing under those foundations of that athlete, that's when it's the scariest bit because then you're like panicking and that's when... Yeah, because it, it's, it of... becomes your be-all and end-all and mm-hmm. that's the position I got myself into was every time I went to the track mm-hmm. to slide, I felt like I was defining myself mm-hmm. over and over again as an athlete mm-hmm. on every single run. Um, and I think possibly we, we need to do a better job of reminding athletes that they're people as well yeah. because I think I certainly had a perception when I came into this sport and that's not necessarily anyone else's responsibility other than mine I, I I'm not sure but I felt like I wasn't allowed to be anything other than athlete mm-hmm. because it was showing if, if I were to put my energy and time into anything else it would be seen as not taking the sport seriously yeah. um and I think that's probably quite common I think that's the culture at the moment yeah um is that you yeah you have to be seen to be yeah. doing it every hour of every day day. exactly um and time away from the sport is seen as a a negative or Mm -hmm. time doing something else is seen as a negative Mm -hmm. but actually i think having something else going for you that's not just your sport can be massively beneficial completely agree do you is that something that you're focusing on then over the next like obviously you've finished the olympic cycle is that something over the next you know as you prepare to carry on Is that something that you're really looking to find more of a balance with and improve on? How are you going to go about that? Definitely. I think, I think naturally as you get older, you, you probably want to start thinking about having other things in your life as Mm -hmm. well. I think just for me, uh, seeing people around me, um, move on to different life stages, you know, so there's obviously there's a phase where everyone's getting married and there's a phase where everyone's having children. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, you sort of end up benchmarking your own life a little bit around Mm -hmm. what your friends and family are doing. So I think, you know, that naturally I'm looking around me and lots of people have started families and and I'm not at that stage yet. So, um, yeah, I'm definitely trying to have a wider view on things and Mm -hmm. not just be an athlete. Um, And, yeah, look, look to what do what, you know, what am I passionate about? What Mm -hmm. what do I want to do with the rest of my life? Because, Mm -hmm. you know, even even long sporting careers are short, really, Mm -hmm. in the grand scheme of things. And, you know, (laughs) what am I going to do for the rest of my life? Mm -hmm. You know, and I I think the thing one of the things that sport has told me is that I want to I want to do something that challenges me. Mm -hmm. I want to do something that's not necessarily a nine to five. Mm -hmm. Um, So trying to find something that fits all those boxes. Mm is yeah it's probably the next big challenge that i've got on the horizon while still both. wanting to slide for a while yeah <laughs> it's uh i think that question of what am i passionate about and being able to say it's not specifically in one lane of a sport is incredible advice and a great question for anyone 
at the highest level or simply playing out of enjoyment because or approaching it even outside of sport I think that's such a one we forget because we get caught up in oh this is the next thing this is the next job this is the next um, you know the rat race the next part of the rat race yeah. and suddenly reframing it then opens it up and you've got a lot more to life than your job or how do I make it something that is my job or whatever it is and I think that that is a great question for anyone listening at any part and stage of their life mm, yeah. um thank you very very much for coming on um it's been an absolute pleasure the last question we kind of talked about it a bit already but the last question we ask at every episode is what makes you more than a skeleton slider what makes you human oh that is a very interesting and difficult question i think i think it's probably the relationships that I've built mm-hmm. both around the sport and also outside of the sport. Um, my teammates are some of my best friends and they've seen me through some very tough times. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think that that's it. It's, it's building those connections with people um, and yeah, having a loving and supportive friends and family gets you through everything. The human connection is probably that's it. Yeah, Absolutely. the foundation to everything I'd agree with massively. Thank you, it's been an absolute pleasure. Pleasure, thank you. Thank you.